Well, let's let's get started then. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, attendees, um, I welcome you to this webinar uh, of the Meta Science 2023 conference. Uh, my name is Lex Bauter and I'm your chair during this webinar. Uh, we have 90 minutes for the topic uh, replication and replicability in the humanities. Um, and most of you will know that the awareness of replication started in the biomedical and the social sciences. And it became quite a big thing once it became clear that replication did it what was not always successful. And, and by now we know that on average, it only works the replication with the same findings in 50% of the studies. Uh, and that was labeled as a replication crisis. And the, the humanity still did their own thing. And, and then a few years ago, uh, Rick Bales, uh, one of our speakers today, and, and your story, uh, we wrote a few comments suggesting that replicability in the humanities might be interesting and important and maybe desirable as well. Um, and that started an whole avalanche of comments and interesting discussions and debates and everything. Uh, and from that, uh, we now started ourselves and also um, identified a, a bunch of interesting studies of replication in the humanities. And that is the theme of, of today. It's mainly about history and art history, uh, but it stands for the humanity as a whole, um, maybe and maybe not. So we will debate that. Um, we will reflect on the challenges each speaker will present for 12 minutes sharp. Then we have six minutes for Q&A after each presentation. Um, and during the Q&A, uh, it would be convenient for me as the moderator to have your questions in the chat noted down and you can start noting down from the moment the speaker starts to speak. You don't need to wait until the, the presentation has ended. Um, and please do it as clear and brief as you can, asking your questions. And then I'm trying to, to take care that at least some of them get attention during the Q&A section. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to pose the part. Um, our first speaker is uh, Rick Bales. I mentioned him already. He will speak about the possibility and the desirability uh, of replications in the humanities. Um, he will, in that sense, introduce the webinar topic uh, a little bit more brief in depth than I did it briefly. Um, and he will also comment um, on a few of the objections that, that came in our directions uh, while we were launching this debate in, in a way. Um, and we learned a lot from them, and I hope that you will learn a lot from that as well this afternoon. So without any further comments, Rick, uh, I propose the floor is yours. Please share your screen with us. Thank you, Lex. Let me um, try to do that straight away. Um, let's see. Um, there we go. Can you all see it now? Does it work? Yeah? Okay, good. Yes, yes I can. So um, a way of start then uh, 12 minutes or so about the very idea, the possibility, and also desirability or value of replication in the humanities. So briefly by way of introduction, um, as Lex already pointed out, there's been a replication crisis, as some people noted back in the 2010s, 2012, particularly in the biomedical sciences, the social science, uh, is also social psychology, trust crisis, or some people also called it, where upon an attempt to replicate original studies, only, only a, a certain percentage of them uh, was successful in doing so. So, and sometimes the failure to successfully replicate was as high as 65, 70, 75, sometimes even 80%. And that was of course considered a problem. Um, it is widely thought that um, there's enormous value to replication whether or not that is actually acknowledged in practice. So among the values of replication are the fact that replication aids scientific progress because replicated results are more likely to be true. It prevents the waste of various resources, such as financial resources, time resources, energy, and so on, since non-replicable results are less likely to be true. Um, results that are not replicable are, if they are applied, more likely to cause harm to society, to individuals, to nature, to animals, and the like. And one, one final consideration is the fact that if too many results turn out not to be replicable, that might, particularly in the long run, erode trust in science or scholarship, academic scholarship, among 
academics, but also among the larger public. So a few years ago, uh, there was a symposium by the Royal Society of Science in the Netherlands, and uh, I think uh, Lex kind kindly ensured that I would be one of the speakers, namely on uh, replication in the humanities. And I hadn't really thought about that, but when I first did, it struck me that given the nature of replication, it should be something possible and perhaps desirable in the humanities. So I defended that on that occasion, and then Lex and I joined forces, as he said, and we have defended that now on, on several occasions, and it has met with some agreement and with some uh, slight disagreement, so to say. And we believe that there are important chances and opportunities to pursue replication in the humanities. So uh, that is what I'm going to briefly speak about today. First, some definitions. Uh, by replication study, I mean an independent repetition of an earlier study, answering the same study question, and usually by using the same or similar methods under the same or similar circumstances. And by independent, we mean that um, it is not dependent, for instance, on the original results or the original agenda. Um, replicability is those joint features of a study that make replication possible in the first place. So replicability does not entail replication, but replication does entail replicability. Successful replication holds or occurs when a replication study delivers the same results or sufficiently similar results as the original study. And straight away, we see that that is a matter of controversy, of course, in certain cases. By the humanities, we mean a wide variety of different disciplines loosely related to one another, things such as anthropology, archaeology, classics, history, linguistics, literary study, philosophy, the study of arts in theology. I'm not going to debate a definition today, but that gives you an impression of what we have in mind. Replication is something that comes in degrees, so it can be more or less successful. A study can be more or less replicable, so more or less lend itself well to replication. And finally, we often distinguish three kinds of replication, so reproduction, direct replication, and conceptual replication. And what we mean by these terms is um, when a reproduction takes place, um, there's a reanalysis of the original, uh, so the existing data sets, whereas with the direct replication, uh, new data are collected, but using the same study protocol, so the same method, for instance. And finally, with the conceptual replication, new data are collected with a somewhat modified study pro protocol, so that can involve new methods that were not employed in the original study. So paradigmatic replication involves independent researchers, even though that's changing nowadays, so more and more often the original researchers are actually on board with the new replication study. Um, with new data, with the original study protocol, and it explains the similarities and differences between the original study on the one hand and the replication study on the other. Now, as Lex already pointed out, our view um, that replication is something possible and desirable in the humanity has met with quite a few different kinds of objections. Um, so let, let us address some of those objections here. Some would say that um, in, in the first place, we can't pursue replication in the humanities because the objects in the humanities are unique in comparison with atoms or viruses or economic trends that you can see in multiple instances. So, for instance, um, take the novel To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf um, or uh, the Russian Revolution in 1917, there was only one of them. So I see that this is a bit of a red herring. The issue is not whether there's a unique object, but whether we can derive, for instance, more data about that new object or reanalyze the original data. So unicity is, I don't think, uh, a relevant issue. And I I, in fact, it holds something similar holds for the sciences. So there's only one space time that's a unique object, but we can still study it and do a replication study of the original study. There's a wide variety of methods. That's the second objection in the humanities. Fair point, but of course the same holds for the sciences and in fact for specific sciences uh, like the biomedical sciences. Some others like Sarah de Rijk and Bart Benders and Britt Holbrook have pointed out that there is meaning beyond truth in the humanities. So often what matters is not so much whether a statement or a proposition is true, but what the meaning of an object is or the meaning of a particular text or a statue. And I think that is actually often right. So indeed we are interested in meaning. Um, but so two thoughts. On the one hand, you might think, well, there can be truths about the meaning of a particular text, for instance. So in analyzing a text of Shakespeare, we can debate what the text means or what the meaning of the text is or what the author meant to say. So that is an important uh, consideration. 
And on the other hand, even if there are multiple meanings to to a particular text, it could still be the case that um, multiple meanings are all equally valid, but some other meanings are not valid. And then studies, as well as replication studies, can be used to rule out certain meanings. So that is another consideration. A fourth objection that we've encountered is that this smells of scientism, if you like. So the sciences, the natural sciences in particular, impose their standards on the humanities, uh, some sort of um, colonialism really in academia. And in fact, that has of course happened at times in the past, but we don't think that this is a particular instance of it. And in fact, we have argued against scientism on several other occasions. Um, it's just that we believe that there is uh, an intellectual desideratum that has been pursued in the sciences that we believe is equally valuable in the humanities. Uh, in the same way as pursuing knowledge and understanding is valuable both in the sciences and in the humanities. Another objection is that humans are interactive entities, so it's different from atoms, for instance, or other inert, um, inert objects, for instance. And we believe that is right, but of course the same holds for fields like biomedicine or sociology, where we study human beings in interaction with their environment, in interaction with other human beings, and sometimes even in interaction with the researcher. So we don't think that is a particularly convincing objection. A sixth objection is maybe more interesting. So I think a lot of scholars in the humanities rightly point out that positionality of the researcher matters to the research. So the researcher's uh, values and principles and background ideas or paradigm or school or connoisseurship. Uh, so one may have studied uh, Renaissance statues in a particular uh, area in Italy for decades, right, and thereby acquire a certain connoisseurship that others don't have. Um, and this is indeed a challenging issue, and, and in fact later on today we will say a couple of more things about it. And the final objection is in a way the opposite. So some people have said, well, uh, we are already doing this, and we've been doing it for ages, for centuries, really. There's nothing new about doing replication in the humanities. So why, why, why act as if, as if this is something new and worthwhile? And we reply that this is, uh, contrary to what some claim, indeed something new in the sense that it's a more systematic and more formalized way of pursuing replication. For instance, by way of pre-registration or making biases explicit that might play a role in research and ways to counter them. So something roughly similar has been going on, but doing it in this more systematic, systematic way is um, of a value that the more informal way does not exemplify. All right, what then are the main arguments for the possibility of replication in humanities? I believe there are two categories of uh, arguments for that. The first one is a priori. Um, and the, the point here is that if you understand what a replication is, so an independent repetition of an earlier study, using say the same data or new data. And if you understand what the humanities do, for instance, history or art history or linguistics, it just follows from the nature of those phenomena that replication is possible, right? Because the humanities are concerned with statements, original findings with data sets that could be reanalyzed or very often there's the possibility of collecting further data. So it just follows from what they are, that it is something possible. And for those who aren't uh, straight away convinced by the APR argument, there are lots of examples actually out there in the humanities that show that something similar is going on, again, even though not in this formalized way. So a lot of scholars have pointed out that uh, the, the famous church father and theologian Augustine was heavily influenced by Gnosticism, a particular school in philosophy. And um, as time progressed, people drew in new data new writings, and time and again, this idea was confirmed. Or take the Rosetta Stone um, that was used to decipher hieroglyphic. There we find the Demotic, the hieroglyphic, and ancient Greek texts. And here would, they would use different bodies of text uh, with languages that they already knew to decipher hieroglyphic. So that was, in a way, already a replication. And finally, in establishing that this painting, pretty unknown, the Sunset at Montmajour by uh, Van Gogh, was indeed a Van Gogh. They used different methods. So they analyzed colors, the themes, the material, um, the wood, uh, the diaries, and so on. And time and again, it was confirmed that it looked like this was indeed a Van Gogh. Finally then, uh, the value of replication in the humanities. So we believe it's not just possible, it's actually also valuable, desirable, worthwhile pursuing. Um, that has to do with the 
the trustworthiness of the original findings. So for the same reason as in the sciences, the trustworthiness of the original finding actually increases once it is confirmed by reanalyzing the data sets, uh, even more so when new data come in and even more so when a revised study protocol leads to the same or similar conclusions. But apart from the trustworthiness of the original findings, if you have your hesitations about that, we believe, we believe there are other gains out there uh, for replication in humanities. So Rachel uh, and Hans and Charlotte will share something about that in a minute, but it has given it a lot of, a lot of insight into the methods, or if you like protocol, of the original studies by seeing what authors have written down, by conversing with authors, by exploring options that maybe they didn't use. So it has helped us enormously to better understand how historical research, or in some cases specifically art historical research is carried out. It has also given us insight into the background assumptions or particular paradigms or schools that particular authors work in. Um, it, it helps us to make future studies uh, more transparent. So we learn what to pay attention to in setting up a study and writing it down. And finally, it teaches us things about the role of value and meaning um, and connoisseurship. So the role of the scholar, scholar in both the original study and in potential replication studies. So again, not just the trustworthiness of the original findings, but there are these other gains as well. All right, that's it, uh, Lex, I hand back the floor to you. Okay, thank you very much, Rick, for this interesting uh, and, and, and thought-provoking introduction. Um, the thing is now open for discussion, uh, but the slight problem I have is I try to change a lot of settings. You should be able to type questions in both the chat and the Q&A. Um, the, the, the question um, module, I believe, um, but there is a technician on the background. Please check these things and enable it for all the participants. Um, and while people are working on that and trying to type in their questions, um, I have one question for you, Rick. Um, I know that you haven't claimed that uh, it's always possible and it's always desirable within the humanities. Um, but I'm, I'm still wondering, um, is it only for humanities when, where they have data, empirical data, or is replication also something to consider in non-empirical corners of the humanities? Uh, uh, maybe like your own trade, philosophy, but there are different examples as well, of course. Well, what are your current views on that? Yeah, uh, uh, great question. So I had only 12 minutes. If I had 25, like it's in my package to share a few thoughts on, on that one. Um, so the way I think um, I prefer to go about is to maybe first focus on the easy cases or relatively easy cases, which are the a posteriori cases. So the empirical cases, the empirical studies where we do indeed collect data. Actually, I personally think that something similar holds for a priori studies, such as in logic or epistemology or ethics, where we don't usually work with data or collecting data or data sets, but with basic beliefs, primary intuitions, and then try to see what we can derive from that or try to establish an equilibrium in ethics, for instance. But I mean, at, at face value, you can of course reanalyze the, the way the original author or authors reasoned. So how they came from those intuitions to their findings or conclusions, right? You can maybe draw in intuitions or principles that they didn't consider. So further data. So if stretching the term a little bit, but analogous mechanisms are, can be found there. So, but I thought, you know, let's tackle the relatively easy cases first. Yeah, well, that's, that's a sensible solution. And, and sorry for the difficult question. <laughs> uh, now, the questions are starting flowing in, which, which is great. Uh, the first one by Harrison Derla, uh, and it is a brief, so it might be a longer name, is uh, when you can't rely on methods that uh, test counter arguments, uh, like randomized clinical trials, why should the focus be on replicating the reasoning rather than rigorously Tracking the arguments and counter arguments. Um, right. So um, let's see. Right. So don't, we don't have uh, randomized controlled trials, of course, in the humanities, but I do think that we can, we do have arguments and counter arguments, and there are ways to test those arguments. So one easy way to test an argument is to check it for its logical validity. Sometimes it's just um, a fallacy, for instance, right? So that's one way to rebut an argument. So I think what we should do is check the original reasoning, 
check the sources where certain sources overlooked how do we get from those sources or at least the data from those sources to the, to those findings uh, did certain biases play a role so all sorts of things can be reassessed uh, not just arguments and counter arguments yeah. so the way it works is a bit different so we don't use randomized controlled trials so the way it works is a bit different but like the basic mechanisms are often pretty much the same yeah a uh, final question and then we move on uh, is a question that that might sound familiar to you um p singh uh, starting with an h uh, says really appreciate your point about the scientism critic in my few words matter to that end can you suggest ways to develop a more inclusive language when talking about open research that is sensitive to and considering the diversity of research disciplines and methods uh, that so that's not natural scientists dictating what open research and meet, meta research is right. well that's that's a sensitivity we, we heard before of course right yeah what, what, what is your take yeah um yeah so we need, really need to think carefully about semantics here um open science open research open scholarship transparent scholarship maybe um, in certain languages like German or Dutch, Wissenschaft, Wetenschap is a term that catches all, all academic activity rather than just the sciences. So certain languages might be better fitted for this. Um, so um, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. We need to work on this. Really important. Yeah. It's, 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 it's always important to point this sensitivity, which is understandable out. Uh, people in the science are usually not aware to, to this. They, they believe that the sciences include the humanities or or forget about the humanities existing anyway so let's let's move on thank you uh, rick again uh, You're welcome. our next speaker is charlotte um, charlotte is trying to replicate uh, a study on the attribution of two paintings uh, depicting rembrandt uh, she will now explain uh, how she's doing that and which challenges she has to navigate and is still uh, over her ears in navigating them. Charlotte, the floor is yours. Thank you for this introduction. Um, today I will tell you about the replicating a Rembrandt study. And this is a study that came out of the, the, the project that Rich, Rick just uh, mentioned. Um, and a study that explores the strengths and limitations of replication in the humanities by aiming to execute a replication study in the field of art history. And today I will first go into the art history level of this study. I will tell you a little bit more about the attribution ingredients, how an attribution generally works and about the original study we are trying to replicate here. Then I will go into the meta level of the study, talk about definitions we use, our approach for replication, and some of the challenges we face. So let's see, we have a painting and we want to attribute it. When working on attribution in art history, you have sort of two pillars you work with. One is that you read the object at hand. The other is that you read the context of this object. And in these two pillars, there are different ingredients you look at and you study more thoroughly. Um, in the object, it can be, in this case, when it's a painting, the support, the paint layers, materials, the way the paint is handled, if there are signatures and whether the painting was changed over time. In the context, you can look at the provenance of a painting. You can look at, um, uh, aside from that, the oeuvre that you su suspect this artwork belongs to. By working this way, you have triangulation in your study. Uh, so different avenues you follow to come to your conclusion of an argument. And this is uh, really a matter of integration of different aspects you study and together they lead you to a certain attribution. And attributions are these days always teamwork. You need different kinds of specialisms within art history to really come to a fundant, uh, 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 fund, a 
an attribution with a good foundation. The study that we're replicating here concerns, concerns these two paintings. These are two portraits of the young Rembrandt. The painting at the left is part of the collection of the Mallet House in The Hague, and for years and years and years was considered to be one of the finest examples of early self-portraiture by Rembrandt. The painting at the right is part of the collection of the Germanisches Nationalmuseum in Nuremberg, and was considered to be a studio copy of the painting at the left, a contemporary one. Until the 1990s, when the Marlott House started technical research into the painting at the left. And with a technique called infrared reflectography, they were able to look under the paint layers of this painting. And to everyone's surprise, an underdrawing was found. Here you see the image of this uh, infrared uh, reflectography. And here I indicate with blue arrows some of the lines which indicate this underdrawing. Well, underdrawing upon that, that moment were not found in the oeuvre of Rembrandt yet. And in addition to that, uh, the style of this underdrawing was considered not to be very Rembrandt-esque. And underdrawings furthermore are often used to transfer one image of one medium to another panel in this instance. These were all arguments that started specialists to doubt this attribution. Because of that, a gathering of the two paintings was organized and the paintings were studied by a group of experts. In the end, all experts that attended this expert meeting concluded that the attribution actually should be the other way around. The painting in the Mauer House is a study of copy and the one in Nuremberg hidden in the, the depot actually was considered to be the painting made by Rembrandt himself. So apart from the underdrawing, and we go back to the ingredients now, the underdrawing is part of the paint layers, which is part of the argumentation. But the experts also look at the handling of the paint. There was an unexpected signature found on the Nuremberg version, and they looked, looked at the oeuvre uh, and thought the Nuremberg painting fitted more in the oeuvre of Rembrandt than the version in the Mallet House. So this was one of the um, well first example of a museum being the Mallet House deattributing its own Rembrandt. And as you can imagine, it caused some um, attention at the time uh, of this reverse attribution that was published. So we talked about the original research. Now let's go into the meta level. The questions that were central at the, in the original research was whether the De Hague version was painted by Rembrandt or not, whether the Nuremberg version was painted by Rembrandt or not, and what was the sequence of these paintings? Does one relay on the other uh, or the other way around? And by for answering this question, technical research was done into the both versions and a live comparison by experts was organized. And these are things that we're replicating at the moment. We're doing this replication according to the definition of replication as put forward by Pils and Bouter in 2018, being an independent repetition of an earlier study, answering the same study question and using the same or similar methods under the same or similar circumstances. A reproduction being the reanalysis of the data set that you already have, a direct replication being a collection of new data with the original protocol, and a conceptual replication being the collection of new data with a modified protocol. Since all these terms like data, protocol, maybe protocol this, but are different terminology that are not traditionally used in art historical uh, research or research in humanities, we first made a definition of the different terms that are used in this study to see um, what we actually think of when we talk about a source in this kind of research and when we, we talk about the meta or data. And in this way, you really can make an exact um, view of what you're actually doing and in which of the categories of replication you're, you're researching. So the source can be a painting in this in instance or an archival source. The method can be a technical method or a literature study and the data can be uh, technical data, but also, for example, a description of naked eye observations. 
So here I have a summary again of these different kinds of replication. For this study, we decided to opt for a reproduction and a conceptual replication. We left the direct rep replication out because of times and means, but also because in this instance, it would mean that we would make all, uh, use all the equipment, old infrared equipment, for example, to reproduce the old images. And it would only filter out little mistakes made in these me me measurements. And um, we thought it was more interesting to go for a reproduction and a conceptual replication. Furthermore, so because if a reproduction would be successful, that would uh, enable us to reflect more on the outcomes of the conceptual replication. This overview, you see the different stadiums of uh, the reproduction and replication in this research. And summarizing the different aspects you can ch can or cannot change when working in a certain area. The reproduction of the study is entailing uh, looking uh, at the paintings again with a naked eye, with infrared, with x-ray, and uh, dendro concerns the dating of the root, which we will repeat. Our conceptual replication is far more broader, and that is because a lot in the past 20 years, lots of techniques have been improved, and there are way more opportunities to make an analysis of these both paintings. So the improvement of tech, technical uh, tools that you use is really another layer that is added to this replication case study. And as you move further away from the reproduction, at a certain point, you can ask yourself, when are we just carrying out an independent new study? And this border is, is kind of a gray area, really. So I wanted to give you a quick impression of how the research looks like. So we're in the middle of conducting the replication at this moment. And here you see the conservation study of the Mauritz house with the painting on the table. Um, and at the right, uh, the, the image of the wood with a little measuring tape is uh, showing uh, a technique that is used to date the wood, so the panel uh, where the painting is made on. And here you see the backside of the painting under a microscope. This research is conducted in close co collaboration with Sabrina Meloni, a conservator of the Maulis Hatch. So there are lots of challenging we've, challenges we face along the way by trying to replicate a study. One of the first challenges was to reconstruct the original study. The study was not set up according to the more traditional way you might uh, write a protocol and uh, conduct a study, but it was caused by a, a coincidental um, discovery uh, that was made during the preparation of an exhibition. So there were no protocols that we could rely on while replicating. Um, Aside from that, there were practical and theoretical uh, feasibility issues uh, of replication of certain aspects of the study. Furthermore, we have the question, are we really replicating in the humanities here? As you have seen, this study is partially very technical. So I really see it as a hybrid case study and working in two kinds of uh, realm. And another example is the example of dealing with bias in replication. Since you are very aware of the original study and the outcomes of the study, because you need to study those before you can design your replication, you have to be very careful in the way you approach it. Another layer of dealing with bias in our study design was that we both do a replication, a reproduction and a conceptual replication, which had, um, in, because of which we had to be very sharp on the order in which we uh, we conducted the research. So the research is done by a very interdisciplinary team of specialists, which also contains one of the original rich researchers, which is uh, who is involved in the in the in the research. And that is the same uh, goes for our advisory committee, which is represented by different specialists, and one of them. Uh, Professor Jan Radom was also one of the original researchers of the study. For the study, we worked with different partners, which you can see in this slide, and you can read more about it in our pre-registration of the study, which is also quite a new thing in art history to, to pre-register a study, um, and a blog we wrote on the website for the Center of Open Science. 
I thank you very much for your attention and feel free to reach out if you have any questions or comments uh, on this talk. Well, thank you very much, Charlotte, for this uh, presenting this interesting study. It's, it's one of the studies um, I can tell easily to all my friends and they all like it. So it's, it's a very nice and neat example of replication in the humanities. It's, it's great. Um, there are not yet questions in the chat, so that gives me the privilege to have my own question on uh, up front, uh, Charlotte. Um, well, uh, there is this interesting exhibition of Johannes Vermeer in the Rijksmuseum currently in Amsterdam. Um, and it was rumored that there were some fake paintings there as well. Um, but my question to you is, would the methodology you have developed now for the conceptual replication, including the consensus meeting, would that be usable um, to study the Vermeer paintings as well? Or, or would that be different uh, when, when we talk about a different painting? Well, um, we're, of course, still in the middle of conducting the study. So we, we really have to see first if it really works what we try to do here. But That's the aside, right answer, of course, but now a, a bit deeper, please. Yes. So aside from that, I think that um, uh, the certain steps we're undertaking and the, really the, uh, the, the, the protocol we're following could be applicable of, uh, on different attribution questions. So not in art history research in general, but certain kinds of attributions. Uh, and the premier attribution is one example of that you could use uh, this methodology, absolutely. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Charlotte. Uh, well, we, we have a, a, a program with many interesting highlights, so we have to move on to the, the next highlight. Uh, that is a double study uh, done by uh, Hans van der Eigen, van Eigen and Rachel Peer. Uh, they, they do a replication uh, on the same original study in a completely different way. Um, we have two small slots for each of them, um, and Rachel will then do the Q&A afterwards. Um, and the, the circumstance is that Hans uh, was unable to attend uh, due for unforeseen reasons, but he made a nice video clip for us. And if everything goes well, uh, Rick is now about to start a video clip, and then Rachel can take over with, with her story and the PowerPoint presentation. Sorry, I can be here. I had some issue at home, but I hopefully I can get the gist of what I've been doing um, this way as well. So we don't have much time, so I will give the briefest of introductions to the study we've been replicating, and then some uh, three lessons we've learned so far by conducting the replication. Okay, so the study we attempted to replicate was a study conducted by John Henry Brooks in the early 90s. He investigated the thesis whether English Puritanism provided a fertile soil for the acceptance of science or practical science, that English Puritans would be more inclined to accept science, or be it practical science, than their non-Puritan Anglican counterparts at the same time. His conclusion is rather negative, that there's no lack of clear evidence from the sources he studied that Puritanisms were more inclined to accept science than non-Puritans. So we've, what I've been doing, I've read through his study thoroughly and I went through all of his sources again and see whether the conclusions he draw from them, they hold the water, whether they are warranted. And I also included some new sources on Puritanism, mainly from New England to assess his overall conclusion that Puritanism did not really contribute to acceptivity of science. And what did we find out? What one are the key, some of the key things we found out so far? One thing is like lack of documentation, lack of transparency, as you may call it. Like Brooke is a thorough historian. He documents a lot or he explains a lot. He has a specific bibliographical essay explaining his sources and where you can find more sources, but still it's not enough. Like there's no clear methodology section where he lays out his research protocol. There's no real documentation of why and how he selected his sources. 
there's no real documentation about certain background assumptions or certain schools of thought that both sort of guide his historical endeavors. So in order to be fully replicable or have more replication studies, historical research will need to like beef up its documentation. Like historians are not in the habit of adding like thorough methodology sections or really explaining how they came to certain conclusions, what sources they used. It's more narrative, it's also just not given often. So this is one step they will have to undertake in order to have more replicable research. And um, another key thing which makes history probably different from other disciplines like the social sciences is like the importance of expertise or connoisseurship. Like we consulted with John Hadley Brook, the original author, and he mentions part of his uh, background assumptions or background thoughts are like inherited from like decades working on historical sources, on reading stuff concerning the scientific evolution, which is somewhere in the back of his head. And you don't really have access to that. And he can't really explain how that all work, uh, comes to the fore in his historiographical research. It's very hard to track his expertise. Also, like the connoisseurship, like historians who had like, ex decades of experience, they have it easier ways of drawing conclusions or noting stuff that rookies or beginners like we don't really have. So this connoisseurship puts an extra burden on replicability. I mentioned not all steps were documented. It's often not very clear how conclusions were drawn. So this is something that can be fixed more easily. And one thing which we did is like consult with the original author, which can give you some more information on these issues, but not always. Of course, these problems come to the fore in the social and biomedical sciences to some extent as well. There is expertise, there is connoisseurship, but it's often easier when we work with harder quantitative data. Lesson two, also something more specific for history or the humanities in general, like hermeneutics, like how, how can you draw a conclusion from a source and are multiple conclusions warranted? Like I mentioned, I sometimes draw different conclusions and Brooke does concerning the same source. Here, for example, on the ratio of Puritans in the Royal Society, Brooke, as he mainly focuses on the majority of non-Puritans, I mainly focus on a specific subclass or the uh, proportion of Puritans given the proportionality of Puritans within the wider population. That sort of warrants different conclusions. It raises the questions, can those two conclusions exist alongside each other? Can both of them be warranted? Or is one more warranted than the other? What does it mean when you're replicating a study? It seems like the conclusion isn't all uh, isn't the only important thing. It also matters how you interpret sources and whether your conclusion is compatible with the original conclusion or not. A third lesson, like it's not even already clear what hypothesis is tested. Like this issue of Puritanism and its relation to science, like I analyzed like different sources on the hypothesis and there are at least three interpretations. There are probably more. And all of them seem to be at work in Brooks' chapter, in his original study. So historians don't always find it easy to like pick one or stick to one, or like interpret all sources in the light of one. They're more like holistic, more broader, which make it difficult to really see whether the original study is reliable or valid. These issues are also more of an issue in the humanities probably than they are in other scientific disciplines. These are the main lessons I really uh, would like to bring to the fore here. There's a lot more to say on this study on how we did the replication as well. You can always contact me with questions if you uh, want to know more. Sadly, I can't answer questions now or enter the discussion. So I hope you enjoyed the rest of the event and uh, please let me know if you want to, uh, want to have more information. Thank you. Okay, Rachel, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Uh, 
I'm happy to continue the presentation. Um, just like Hans is doing the direct replication on the, the historical chapter written by John Headley Brook, uh, I have been appointed to do the conceptual replication. So uh, unlike Charlotte, we don't have to do both of these things. We're each focusing on, on a separate area of this replication process. And uh, it's been a real pleasure working with the group. Um, Sometimes I stay right from the start that the group was very open in uh, embracing me as part of the group and that I wasn't a converted replications uh, person from the start. Uh, I told them up front, I'm an agnostic. It's an interesting subject. I'm intrigued and I want to learn more about it. And they said, great, that's what this is all about. And so uh, I am still remain, I'm sticking with my agnostic status. We'll see what happens at the end, but uh, it's actually fun being uh, the, the, the questioner and the staying undecided uh, while hearing all these different perspectives. So I really have enjoyed it. Um, one of the first questions we have is what is a conceptual replication in terms of what does a slightly revised protocol mean in terms of a historical study? So in our case, we were looking at uh, if Hans was doing the same thing as Brooke in terms of looking at Protestant and Catholic responses to Copernican thought. Uh, my study is looking at Jewish responses to Copernican thought. Is that just new data or is that a revised protocol? It actually also reminds me of the question that came up earlier when people said, how can we make this more user friendly for humanities scholars? Does the word protocol even reverberate with humanities scholars, with historians? And that's something that really speaks to me uh, of making this, having a lot of conversations with historians, making this come from the inside. So for this study, uh, our group has decided that looking at a different religious tradition, in this case, Judaism, is, is the definition of a revised protocol and not just new data. So that is the contours of my study. Um, I did break it down into two sub questions. Um, so we're looking at both whether the Jewish historians and their sources, the, they happen to be Jewish historians, but the historians who looked at the Jewish material, um, if they uh, corroborate this qualification of the link that had previously uh, been drawn between uh, Protestants and greater openness to the novel scientific ideas, and in this test case, Copernican thought. And then there was a second sub-question uh, that we focused on, as, as Hans was saying, this chapter is very rich, so there are lots of different aspects to it. Uh, but we uh, really identified the second sub-question being that social factors are very important. And again, that it can't be deterministic in terms of the denomination, that just the theology is the only thing that led to it. There are other issues at play here. So uh, as I mentioned, the questions abound. The truth is I thought I might take this opportunity that the first time we are actually, I am presenting, I think Hans had the chance of presenting with the historians from the Utrecht Univers the University in Utrecht. Um, Pim is here today, thank you. Uh, we looked at your white paper very carefully because we found it to be the only replication, in your case, a reproduction uh, in the discipline of history. So that's very meaningful for us that we have someone to have conversations with. Um, so there's really a very different stance that your project takes to our project um, in your arguing only for reproductions and not for the relevance of direct or conceptual replications in history. Um, and one of your arguments for that here, uh, I put a quote up on the screen. Uh, if historiography is a deliberately subjective discipline in which the person and the background of the scholar, which obviously has been mentioned a number of times already, this is going to be layers, everyone's touching on the same subjects, rather than a hindrance are a necessary precondition for acquiring knowledge, then no two scholars, except perhaps identical twins, can be accept, expected to produce the same outcomes. Um, and we're very curious and interested um, in this idea of what kind of uh, replication um, can be expected or not. We believe it relates to the different um, categorizations that have already begun to be outlined by philosophers of science uh, like Leonelli in 2018, uh, where she identifies different categories of where expertise and observation is reproducible and where it's not. Um, and we felt that your study took a particular stand on it and we weren't sure that uh, we agreed with that particular stance, but we think that that's really great for, for further conversation and, and meeting it out further. There have been other schemes that have also been looking at these issues um, of where history fits in, in terms of 
participant observation or describing other ways of, of doing work in different disciplines. And we feel this is a very fruitful area to continue the conversation. So just to give you a little bit about what I'm doing with the Jewish material on one foot, um, the first question was, you know, is this comparing apples and oranges? That's why I have two apples there. Hopefully we're comparing two apples and not apples and oranges. But as um, Hans was talking about, Brooke's chapter is wonderful, very readable, um, and not boring in the sense of giving a very strict methodology, um, but also then we weren't sure what cr chronological period in particular we should be looking at, what geographical expanse in particular we should be focusing on. Something that came up in our conversation with the historians is the Jewish material is different that um, not all the rabbis we'd be looking at have university backgrounds and degrees. Is that relevant here? Um, so these were all questions that were important for us as we were beginning to go through the sources um, and whether Brooks uh, differentiation that he does talk about towards the end of the chapter of moderates versus more extreme positions, if that was in fact relevant for the Jewish material. So what have we been doing? As Hans mentioned, the original author is on our advisory board as um, our other historians and also uh, people we tried to search out on both advisory boards, people who have offered critiques of, uh, of uh, replication studies. So we have Britt Holberg also on our, our, um, our board who was one of the co-authors of one of the papers mentioned above. Um, so we've been having a lot of conversations with them as well as historians that are not on the board. Uh, we are working with what it would mean to pre-register a historical study. We actually have a revised version of the initial pre-registration that we're about to, to upload. Um, and that's been an interesting process to think about and reflect on in and of itself. Um, and then, of course, it's just jumping in and documenting the historians' analyses and compiling all sorts of charts and different resolutions to try to analyze what would be important here. Um, so very much on one foot, if I would try to give the state, I actually didn't press my timer to see where I am on my six minutes, uh, but what would it mean to have a successful reproduction uh, replication here? What are we looking for in the material? Uh, we have a fairly early acknowledgement of Copernican thought in the Jewish sources. We have fairly early praise, and we even have a fairly early seeming embrace of Copernican thought. But then after that, we also have thought leaders who reject Copernican thought. So is this enough uh, to corroborate Brooks' uh, thesis that it's uh, that there's acceptance of Copernican thought in the Jewish sources, even if it's not linear, even if it's not global, to try to understand it? And my work has been a little bit complicated in, by the fact that there is a current researcher really working on a lot of new materials that he hasn't yet released. Uh, but uh, we're we're in touch with him all the time and always updating the study based on what what everyone can uh, let us know about their work. Um, in terms of the second sub question I had mentioned above, on the one hand, this was an easier question: the fact that social factors are important here, and it's not a theological determinist perspective. This was universally embraced across the board. On the one hand, Brooks thesis was definitely corroborated. But the question that emerged is, is this actually an important corroboration or is this trivial? Is this just um, a development within the historiography of the field more generally? That Brooke was part of a time period when he wrote the chapter, that it was important to fight against this issue of thinking of things in this sort of closed deterministic perspective. And then there's just been this more general turn of understanding of the social issues and the importance. Um, and so therefore, the fact that it's been corroborated is not surprising because it just reflects the development of history. So on the one hand, the second question is easier. On the other hand, it also raises, I think, uh, interesting and important questions to think about. So uh, I think my last slide is just a quote that shows how one of the historians really embraces, or we have many quotes of how the historians embrace this new perspective. Uh, so he said, Jewish, Jewish discussion about demarcating 
spheres of physics and metaphysics reflected an emerging consensus of Protestant and Catholic thinkers, that was his uh, parentheses, not mine, about the appropriate structural relationship between scientific learning and Christian faith in the early modern era. So they're not focusing on the difference between Protestant and Catholic thinkers, but rather how theological changes were shared between these communities and with Jews as well. So um, this was uh, an example of how we see the second question really coming through strongly uh, in the materials that I've been looking at. So happy to answer questions, try to answer them on Hans's uh, materials as well, but certainly on anything that we can related to our project. Thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, Rachel, uh, together with Hans, you dis displayed uh, really in, in, in a small slot of time a lot of details and interesting elements of your studies. It's, it's quite fascinating to me. There's one point I completely disagree, as you can imagine. Uh, you said something about uh, Brooke was not boring readers with methodology, and you mentioned that positive. That was not nice to a methodologist like me. <laughs> Uh, I'm well, usually I bored when I see a lot of theory in the paper. But anyway. Uh, well, I've heard that come to... up as a critique uh, within no, the no, discipline. No, I I'm think just your joking. colleague is no. smiling because that was one of their critiques, if I'm not mistaken, that it's actually a style in the humanities. So we're looking to be inclusive and not scientific in terms of being organic from within the disciplines, also in terms of the terminology and also in terms of are we expecting certain stylistic um, commitments that are not in concert with what the discipline itself, uh, how I, it views I, itself. It's an I, interesting I, question, I think. I got, I got your point. And and, and of course, I was still talking. But I'm anyway. I'm going to punish uh, you for it uh, uh, by moving on to the next speaker because, as a chair, I have the duty to do timekeeping as well. And I really apologize, but it was an impossible program, and I want to give the opportunity to the last two speakers as well. Uh, so, Tim Haune, um, he is the next speak, speaking speaker. Um, he is uh, already mentioned by Rachel. Um, he is uh, also looking at uh, th the way replication goes in the history. And as said before, he is a fan of reproduction and not so much of the other types of replication. Uh, please go ahead, uh, Pim. The floor is yours for your slots. Thank you very much. You, you can all hear me, I take it. And you I can see so. And it's not in the presentation mode yet, your slides, I guess. It is not. Uh, okay, well, I'm afraid I cannot fix that on such short oh, notice yeah. because it is in my screen. Okay, well, can you move from one slide to the other? Try I can, place? I can. So if but you can do see it, slide, whether we can see it. Yeah, I think that will do. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. In this symposium, it's it's been really interesting thus far, and I've heard a lot of uh, things that um, that I will briefly touch upon as well. Um, what I would like to do uh, in this talk is to share with you some uh, experiences from from different, well, I would say experiments with replications in history that I did, particularly a project and also a course that I did together with my colleague at Utrecht University, Pieter Huistra, who unfortunately couldn't make it today. Uh, I will in this talk tell you something about why we, start, why we started these experiments, explain a little bit what we did and end with some observations. Um, now, as you have already heard in the previous talks, um, the default stance, you could say, towards replicability is that it's, it, it's, it's not really relevant for historical scholarship. Uh, and uh, that's particularly true for the field of cultural history, where Peter and I are from. Um, as historians, we are not out to discover once and for all how reality works, but rather add different interpretations about historical reality next to existing ones give two historians the exact same research question, the exact same data, the exact same method, and you will get two, well, maybe not completely, but um, surely different answers. This is um, uh, probably what, what Rachel in her talk uh, referred to when it comes to uh, my problems with conceptual replications. Um, however, our, our starting point, um, 
and this is my next slide. If if I don't hear anything, I take it you can uh, you can see it. Our starting we, point. We was, can, I, I cannot. I'm sorry. Uh, you cannot. Um, then I will try something different. Uh, this might work. Try try again. No, it goes you? big. It goes big. Okay. Um, yeah, this this is okay. So do it with your uh, okay. your mouse. This I'll is do the it same like one. this. If you can see it now, then we'll yes. sign. Okay. Sorry for that. Um, our starting point, that, that's, that's where, where I left, is what, what happens if we try to do replications anyway? Um, it was an open question to us, uh, but um, uh, we thought it was relevant uh, because um, checking existing scholarship uh, is becoming more and more easy the more our data uh, wh which traditionally, obviously, is, is stored in, in often far away archives, if that data is being digitized and made available online. Checking existing scholarship simply is becoming more and more easy. So you can imagine people starting to replicate existing scholarship, whether you want it or whether you believe in it or not. The other argument is, uh, our argument is that that our discipline has traditionally uh, uh, always had an open mind to replicability. Um, footnotes are open invitations, really, to check what information is based on. A peer review exists. And, and that's also our argument. We already do things like conceptual and also direct replications. Uh, where research questions are approached with different kinds of data and or methods, but we just don't call it like that. Th this is what we call the historiographical debate. Th this is really what our field is based on. We believe, however, that there's also something to say for, for the strictest form of replications, reproductions, where you follow an existing study as literally as possible. And the aim of, of doing this for us um, is, um, uh, is not only to test robustness, um, to check for epistemic consolidation, do the claims hold or not, but more to see what is happening in historical argumentation. Is the argumentation sound? Um, and this question, we believe, is as relevant for our field for history as it is for any. Now, this is at the same time a, a normative question, but also a descriptive one, something simply to learn from. What is happening when historians are making claims for something? And this is seemingly a, a very obvious or maybe even a trivial question, but we've noticed that, that it can become a lot more difficult once you really take a closer look. Um, and interestingly, our, our field lives by these different interpretations that I mentioned, but we also agree that not every interpretation is legitimate or allowed. So the question that, that we hope reproductions can answer is, um, yeah, what, are, what distinguishes um, legitimate from illegitimate interpretations? So this is what we did. We, we took that closer look and we did that on two separate occasions. Um, once in, in a smaller uh, pilot project uh, that was called Once More with Feeling, a project in which three groups of two students replicated historical publications from three different subfields of history. And once in a course for PhD students that we actually just finished. Both. Uh, I stress were really quite experimental. Uh, we've used the project and of course to, to learn how historians argue, what sound scholarship looks like, but also how replications in history could actually be done in the first place. Um, and to, to make it for us the most worthwhile, the most interesting, we, we've gone to quite some length to pick studies of, of really of high quality. So that means relevant scholarship by established scholars in respectable, respectable 
publications. And while it, it like I said, remained a, a true open question how replications in history can be done in the first place, one thing was clear to us soon enough uh, that it makes sense to start from the end, from, uh, from the conclusions or the claims, what, what we here call minimal repl reproduction. In this way, we avoid exactly the problem that I mentioned earlier, that if you start with the exact same research question, uh, copy the exact same data or sources, the exact same method, yeah, you can, of course, still arrive at different conclusions. So now we and our students start with these conclusions, with the claims from the original authors, and try to trace these all the way back to the premises of the study. Uh, and we, we um, found this really a good way to assess the transparency of, uh, of scholarship. Now, um, in, in, in terms of observations, an, an, an interesting thing happened in most of the, the cases that we and, and our students um, studied. Um, most of these, of these studies were compelling. They were relevant. They were interesting. Um, uh, all, all really good examples of historical argumentations. Still, once we took a, a detailed, a closer look, uh, we often notice some, some odd things, things that I've tried to put under the header of two main observations. First, historical scholarship could easily be more transparent than often is the case. We've um, heard that in the previous talks as well. Sometimes references are lacking where you would expect them, or references are much vaguer than you would like. Um, well, there, there, there is this very strong tradition in history when it comes to source criticism, but far less so in saying about how you went about methodologically exactly. And um, one of the things that, that, that were interesting that struck us were, was that, that often the more prominent a scholar is, the less strict they are or they seem to be in, in, in being transparent. It's, it, it is as, as if they're saying, well, believe me, it is me who is claiming this, so, so I don't need any footnotes. It, it, it is me, you know. Um, and this, this observation alone already hints to the fact that these examples of um, intransparency, we think, are, are not so much consequences of ignorance or fraud or something, but rather of implicit norms and codes. So that, that, that would mean that in spite of how we teach research practices to our students, uh, there does not seem to be a single formal or strict way of guaranteeing transparency in historical scholarship. Historical scholarship tends to be very much geared toward, toward specific in-groups, specific audiences of experts and peers. Um, but, and yeah, the question to us remains open whether this is a good thing or a bad thing or, or maybe simply an unavoidable thing. But, but it is something that really struck us. Second, um, what historians like to do is they like to evoke images of past realities. That, that, that is really what we do. Um, pieces of information from literature or examples from sources are then mobilized to fill in this particular image and the plausibility or, or soundness or the quality, if you will, of such interpretations then depends on, on the usefulness of the picture of the past that, that is painted to interpret these sources or, or, or data. Um, and, and this very often, at least in the examples that we scrutinized, leads to arguments that are not so much out to prove that something must be the case, but rather that something might be the case. And often arguments in this way of reasoning are replaced by examples. So this is what, 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 I, what I claim, and here's an example that, yeah, fits that claim. Um, I have two examples here in, in, in this slide um, from that, that we came across during, um, uh, during uh, our experiments um, that are really illustrations of what I mean with in invoking this image of the past. On the top, um, it's, it's uh, from a study that's on historical newspapers, and the author um, writes that, that 
that, um, well, in the early 20th century, newspapers probably proceeded to sit on the kitchen table for most of the week to be lead through at odd moments of the day, um, underlining the importance of these newspapers. Yeah, of course, the, the, I, I can immediately imagine this to be the case. It can be. It doesn't necessarily need to be the case, of course. And, and that, that is not something that this author, author even tries or begins to argue for. Um, the, the example below is from, an, from a comparison between two images where the argument is that, that, that uh, the second image by the Hoge um, appeals much more to the senses than, than the other image. You, you can hear the cries, you can feel the heat, you can smell the odor. Yeah, it, it can be again, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Right, so 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 th there is no argument here. There, there's simply an, an invocation of an image, and this is very typical for historians. Um, we experienced, and yeah, it, it, in 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 terms of replicability, sometimes problematic. Okay, I come to my conclusions. Um, that is to say, I don't have any definite conclusions for that both the project and the course uh, that Peter and I have been doing were way too experimental. But based on these observations that I just shared with you and others, uh, I can say that what I thought I knew about sound historical scholarship has become less certain, while to us the place that replications in history could have has, has only become clearer and definitely more interesting. We ourselves have learned a great deal from what we have been doing thus far, so we will definitely keep on working on this topic and keep spreading the word, for example, by way of the white paper that uh, Rachel already men mentioned that we have written that you can find through this link. And with that, I um, end my presentation. Well, thank you very much, Pim. Uh, and, and echoing your last sentiment, um, I'm becoming more agnostic about replication in humanities myself uh, uh, as well, I believe. It's, it's quite intriguing what has been on the table so far during this, this, this meeting. Uh, and uh, Rick Pales, he has a burning question, and he asked me whether he would be allowed to put it on the floor. Uh, Rick, what is your question? Yeah, thank you, Pim. A wonderful presentation. I really liked it. Um, I felt there was a bit of a tension or paradox, like moving towards a contradiction at times in the presentation. So I felt at the outset you were highly skeptical, saying things like, uh, we don't want to make any once and for all statements. Well, who does? Uh, but uh, statements or claims, uh, we just add another interpretation, things like that. And then towards the end, you were rather happy about at least the reproductions. So, so here's my question. Wouldn't you agree that historians do make statements? They can be, they can be true or false at times, right? And um, the purpose is not just to add another interpretation. It's easy to add another interpretation. The, the purpose really is to add a better interpretation, maybe, or one that is more accurate, explains more, better fits the data, and so on. And if you're enthusiastic about a reproduction, why not a conceptual replication as well? So, if, so the Battle of Leipzig, how many people died? Um, well, let's look not just at letters, but also no, results of excavations, for instance, or I don't know, other kinds of reports, right? right. So, so you slightly so use a slightly different method and you, you see whether the original results of, I don't know, 100,000 people died or so, whether, whether that holds. Doesn't that make perfect sense? Yeah, <laughs> thank you. you a little. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it, it definitely makes sense. So, so um, um, uh, maybe I wasn't clear in my formulation, but but I'm 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 not against conceptual replication. What I'm saying is, th this is this is um, what what history is is all about. This is what we do all the time. Because uh, well, examples that that you gave just now, yeah, this is exactly what historians do. Somebody studies a, a particular question based on particular source material. And then a, a colleague comes in and says, well, yeah, I've studied the same question, uh, but use this, um, uh, this source material. And I come to similar, but also sometimes opposing 
uh, conclusions. Yeah, no harm in that. Um, so, so, so that is, um, uh, uh, I think, perfectly fine. I, I just think that conceptual replication as a way to assess, uh, to evaluate particular claims um, can be problematic because there can always be multiple interpretations of the same reality. So, so you can never um, say, uh, or yeah, well, that, yeah, that, 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 I think that, that is very typical for, um, for historical scholarship. And you, you can look at the same reality from different angles. Um, so who, in the end, somebody makes a claim about reality, you, um, you yeah, um, approach the, the same research question uh, in a different way, make an opposing claim. Who will ever decide who is correct? Um, that's very difficult, given that our reality isn't there anymore, cannot decide upon that. Uh, yeah. Well, we're not debating, Rick. I'm sorry. I, I see you're waiting to respond. And but it, it's interesting. We need another midi to to hammer this out because this this seems to be one of the real issues we we are discussing together. So maybe we should organize a, a, a debate one day or the other. But but my my humble task today is timekeeping, and I'm not too good at it. But I'm I'm doing another attempt and want to give Stephanie the floor. Uh, Stephanie um, Meermans, uh, she's doing ethnographic research about us. Uh, she is in a way the fly on our wall. Uh, you cannot see it on our screens, but but that's what she's doing. And she will present, uh, I've seen the slides already, and quite interesting catalogs of recent reasons given to do replication studies. And uh, please, Stephanie, share your interesting work with us as well. Well, thanks, Lex, for the introduction. I try to be quick, but I'm not sure I can make it in time. Um, so I will tell indeed about our project. And I want to emphasize I'm not um, doing this project alone, but I'm doing it together in a team um, with my colleagues, Jona, Martin, and Jeanette. Um, well, this doesn't work. Okay. Um, can you see that it switched? Yes, some, something happens. It's OK. Okay, so um, if we, so I want to take a step back and ask uh, what I will do is to um, to have a look at how do the humanities fit with other replication studies, and um, so if you if we take that step back and ask in the in the first place why do why do we think it's important to replicate? I think historically it started with an instances of dubious papers, so fraud cases and the realization that maybe there are questionable research practices uh, abundant in science. And then there were attempts to replicate. Um, and um, somebody mentioned it already. There was this psychology studies that were um, on trying numerous of them to replicate them, but that didn't work. Uh, so there were a lot, lots of failures. So I think about 40% did not replicate, which was very alarming. And uh, it, 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 they were, um, the recognition of replication crisis, which is why a lot of people said, well, we should replicate more often. And not only because of that crisis, but also because it seems to be a central thing to do in science um, with the intention to correct the scientific record. And um, well, Rick already mentioned it. So there was this um, paper that we should do the same in the humanities. It seems important to replicate there as well. And um, there were counter arguments and we already talked about that. But what I want to do here, these are the main questions for this talk. Are the humanities special when looking at replication and practice across fields? As for example, Sarah and uh, Bart have been arguing. Um, and then what is the meaning of replication and does this, does this differ between fields? Um, and so in our project, we are uh, investigating 28 replication studies in practice. So there has been the NWO, the Dutch research funder has been um, uh, uh, giving money for replication studies and they have been funding 24 in total. And you can see in this table, um, 21 of the 24 um, agreed to participate in our project. Um, so we are following them and seeing what happens in practice when you try to replicate and um, what problems are they hitting, uh, how do they try to solve this, what is the impact of their um, uh, projects. And we have added uh, seven other studies because the, the design was quite unbalanced, as you can see. 
Um, so we do interviews with replication researchers. We observe what they do in practice, and we also gather documents like applications, reviews, um, paper drafts, etc. And I want to emphasize the pool that I have in the humanities. They are all historical uh, studies. So I can't say much more beyond uh, history uh, for the humanities. Um, so if we look back at, so we, we are, were uh, uh, following these projects and they are uh, doing uh, research uh, along this empirical cycle of, you know, you, you start a study due to a certain motive, then you write an application, you have a certain design for your study, then you conduct the study and then it has a certain impact. If we look at sort of the, the assumptions for doing a replication, it seems to be that the motive is to detect QRPs in original studies. The replication design is hopefully a, or supposed to be an exact replication. So also NWO was asking for direct replications or reproductions only. Um, reasoning that the, the rest is normal science. Um, conducting the study is straightforward to do and to interpret. And the impact is to correct previous literature. So we approached this, of course, with much more open stance. So we were just simply asking, what are your motives? What is your design? How do you conduct the study? And what's the impact? So if we go through this, and I will put an emphasis on the humanities here. Um, what is the motive? Is it really detecting QRPs in original studies? Well, we already heard also um, this, it was more a pioneering stage. Uh, we simply want to try this out. So not ask how much sense does it make, but simply experiment with replication and then see afterwards how much sense it makes. But we also heard that, and Pim just also said this, that going over the same material, the same sources again, is in fact often done in history. It is nothing new. It's just not called replication. Um, so it's, it, it's definitely not about detecting QRPs per se. What about the medical and the social sciences if we compare this? Well, for a lot of psychology studies, this um, checking whether the original study has been done responsible is somewhere in the background. But if you ask them for the specific study they're replicating, this is not usually the reason. It's far more often the reason that they want to corroborate the original findings so that they say, well, this is an important effect. This is a landmark study. Everybody's blowing up on it. We really need to see whether this is true. It can also be a meta-analysis in medical sciences. Some have actually used the funding rather pragmatically, tweaking something they anyway wanted to do into a replication. So it's not really about detecting QRPs in original studies. What about the design? Is it an exact replication in the humanities? Uh, one scholar said a direct replication would be trivial. It would be weird to not take a new data that came out afterwards because I'm interested in the findings. Another one said, hmm, but when does it come a conceptual replication? So it's actually quite difficult to, to, to draw the lines. Um, another said, it took me some time to change what I wanted to do and fit it into the replication study, uh, emphasizing that it's actually quite difficult in the humanities. What about the medical and the social sciences? Is it so much easier? Um, no, actually, there is a, a, a continuous scale between doing something exactly as the original and doing something different from the original, which would be a conceptual replication. Um, NWO was actually emphasizing certain changes itself. For example, you should have a larger sample size. You should do better statistics. But researchers also emphasized it does make not make sense to use outdated technology or measurement devices. You do want to use the newest state of the art. And you want to correct, for example, cer for certain original papers, there had been some errors uh, pointed out or shortcomings. You don't want to repeat them. And then medical uh, researchers also several times highlighted it's important to redo a study or to replicate a study and use another population. So in this case, another country. But I also have been meta analyses, so throwing several replication studies um, and seeing what is, what is the outcome. So triangulated or integrated them. What we see is there's a trade-off between doing an exact replication and doing something that you might call good or state-of-the-art science. So mostly what we see in practice is not really exact replications. Uh, conducting the study, is it straightforward to do and to interpret in the humanities? Um, this scholar says it takes much longer than expected. 
Another one says, the hypotheses are not explicitly formulated as such, so you have to kind of delve them up. It's not so easy to know what to exactly do. How exactly do you need to trace the sources, the footnotes? What is enough and who decides this? And this one says, it does show how important it is to actually talk to the original author. Otherwise, we would not have known this. So because it, there was digging up uh, extra information and far more information that was in the text. Do we see something different in the medical and the social sciences? Well, the time aspect of this takes a lot of time. It's a lot of effort. Um, yes, that's definitely the case. In psychology studies, they think it's made sometimes even more effort than doing an original uh, uh, study. Um, this, for example, also because a lot of methodologists want to have super huge sample sizes to make the interpretation easier. Um, it's not often clear what actually has been done from just reading the text or reading the supplements, but often the original author needed to be asked. And then, even then, um, there were lots of other decisions and changes to be made. For example, there was this one study who, that used a horror movie uh, to stress out people, uh, to participants. But actually that horror movie um, was not so much horrific anymore nowadays, even though it was available. They needed to redo the movie just because it wasn't having the same effect nowadays anymore. Of course, there were also all these changes that I talked before about that they were introduced and that made the interpretation actually incredibly difficult. And then of course, everybody is working in a team, so teams might differ in what they think is important. And then some try to um, overcome certain um, problems with, um, so an exact replication makes it easier to compare with the original versus a different one is more to the state of the art. So they branched their study and did both, but that actually is, a, a, is another addition of time and effort. So straightforward to do an interpret, it, it's not usually. What about the impact? Is it about correcting the previous literature? In the humanities, we heard, how can it be that we detected all these problems? So this is already indicating um, that there can be actually wrong things popping up. But simultaneously, we were aware that somebody had made a career with this paper and that actually makes it very difficult. How do you handle that? And how do you actually, do you write that in a publication or do you contact the original author? How do you actually handle this if you find something strange? It seems important to get into conversation with the original author. So this is the way of, of uh, you know, instead of through a publication, you just, you, you get, get into conversation, which seems to be maybe the better way. We got much more critical of our own writings and of others. This is a very broad effect. We do, um, what do we see in medical and social sciences? Actually, the hesitations, if you find something dubious to make accusations is, is the same in these fields. Getting into a conversation with original researchers and or diving more into the details is also something that we see. And then you can actually see that it's due to the details why, why, why there is a failure. Um, superseding the original. So the meta study, uh, meta analyses um, emphasizes that it might be important to see this as new results and not correcting. The impact of publication is variable. So not everybody is actually um, achieving anything with um, uh, publishing a failure because the original study is still cited. Um, a lot of um, medical and social science uh, researchers told us they became much more critical. Um, they were looking at all the details. They saw the importance of transparency. Um, they realized complexity in science, all the choices and decisions that they are making and how they impact the results. Um, and then, so if I go back to my main questions, are the humanities special when looking at replication and practice across fields? And I'm, again, I'm talking about historical uh, research. I actually don't think it's that special, um, but they put an even stronger attention to contextuality, text, and the author as a person. What is the meaning of replication? Does this differ between fields? Well, I actually still don't think it differs so much between fields, but there seems to be a different meaning than typically assumed. So what, and this is, I guess, my take home message, we may need to rethink the meaning of replications, what it is and what it does. Um, it, I think it is, our study shows it's more about gaining a richer understanding of the original study in its context, enabling triangulation with newer insights, which then can lead to robustness or to conversation with the, with the original authors. 
It's also about broadly to gain a deeper understanding of how we actually make knowledge and practice and that it's often local. Importantly, I think it requires time, care and respect to do replication work well. And the humanities could contribute in how to deal with contextuality. Um, and I'm here at my last slide, uh, I'm acknowledging and I'm thanking all the replication researchers involved in our project and that share with us their insights. And I want to put attention to that we actually have a blog where we also post insights. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Stephanie. This is really fascinating material. It, it, it shows that in, in clinical medical terms that replication might have some beneficial side effects which are really interesting. It's it's great. Uh, um, and 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 by the way, in the chat, there is an interesting uh, discussion developing, starting by Rachel, who who kindly reminds everyone that we already organized a meeting to have a, a lengthy debate on our matter, um, and that will be in in June. The link is in the chat for every one of you. Um, and and to you, Stephanie, personally, I was quite fascinated by, by that you said. Um, the sciences can learn from the humanities as well when we talk about replication. And, and I tend to agree. You, you mentioned the point of, of contextuality. Um, can, can you give an example? And then maybe also please explain how that differs from what our preoccupation is, mainly with generalizability. Um, so I think that, uh, uh, for example, there was uh, there's one study where um, uh, there seemed to be a replication failure. Um, and so um, that person then did not say it's a failure, but went into the details, looking up, okay, where is this coming from? How can we explain this? And actually, it, what, what, what occurred then was that something that appeared to be standard across uh, this, the, 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 this, the, the, in the field wasn't as standard. So they actually generated their data in very different ways, which could explain the difference. So that's the contextuality of, for example, how you generate data. Yeah, well, that, that clarifies it. Thank you so much. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, and to all of you, I apologize again to, to be uh, rude and end the meeting, um, but I'd like to, Thank the speakers, uh, really. It has been a very interesting uh, event, uh, at least to me, and I hope to all of you. Uh, it was great to have some interaction. Um, the time was too brief to have a lot of interaction, but still, it, it made people think, at least it made me think about replication again. Um, it's wonderful. Thank you for organizing this whole show, uh, Charlotte, and all the technical people uh, from the US behind it. Uh, it's really great to have the opportunity to do this. Um, um, with that, I'd like to thank all the participants as well for being patient with our technical glitches, but we, we survived and it went quite well altogether. No problem at all. Uh, so thank you so much and I hope to see you um, uh, on other occasions on replication in the future. Thank you. Bye-bye.